No, Welcome, not. everybody. Thank you for inviting me to come. Um, it's a subject I'm always happy to talk about. And one thing that's occurred to me recently is actually is how topical it is. Because um, the reason that there was so much smuggling in the 18th century, or one of the reasons, was that there were very high taxes on luxury goods that were imported. And the reason there were very high taxes was because the government in the late 17th, early 18th century had really only just about invented the national debt. And the reason that people took the national debt seriously was because Britain had a very effective taxation system. Um, but because um, they only had about three big taxes at that time, which were customs, which were imported goods, excise, which are more or less home goods, and land tax, they bore a disproportionate weight of the income that was generated, uh, particularly as nearly all the members of parliament who voted would have paid the land tax, so that was kept well down. Anyway, so people then smuggled to avoid paying taxes, which is uh, not unlike some of the things today. So smuggling, in a way, is sort of tax evasion, but in a rather different way. So um, this, this talk, as some of you will know, rose out of my work at Guns Green House um, in Eyemouth, uh, where uh, when I started work there in 2008, uh, it turned out there was very little um, detailed information being found about the house. So um, I started digging around and wonderfully, John Nisbet, who built Guns Green House in 1753 to five, um, had been made bankrupt. And although the bankruptcy papers didn't, haven't survived, there are lots of related court cases which describe in great detail his business career and his business career related to um, smuggling in, um, in the North Sea area now to try something clever now, which I don't know if I can do or not. Oh, perhaps I won't. I might frighten myself. No, that didn't work. Anyway, never mind. Oh, well, that'll do. Um, but as you can see, the, 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 oops, the best place to smuggle um, from is across the North Sea. And the goods that people wanted were luxury goods. And the luxury goods really were wine, which didn't come from across the North Sea, uh, and tea. And the other thing that had happened in parallel to all these taxes was that be they were able to impose the taxes because the, the people realised in the late 17th century that if you ate sugar as lump sugar, it damaged your teeth. So they came up with a brainwave that if you dissolved sugar in a hot liquid, it wouldn't damage your teeth. And of course, we all know that's true. Um, so in parallel with the growth of sugar plantations came the growth of what's called the bitter drinks, which is tea, coffee and chocolate, which then dissolved the sugar and allowed for steady increases in sugar consumption. So there's all this stuff going on more or less simultaneously. Now, Tea, which was the, the prime product, um, because it came from the East, and the East India Company of London had a monopoly on all British trade to the east of the Cape of Good Hope, which meant that tea, coming from China at that time, didn't come from India until a lot later, coming from China, uh, was strictly controlled by the East India Company. So it had an East India Company monopoly and therefore the ability to fix prices and also very heavy taxation, which ultimately went up to about 120%. So this encouraged the growth of East India companies throughout Europe. Most of the maritime countries of Europe of any size 
ended up with an East India Company. Even Austria-Hungary had an East India Company because they controlled the Austrian Netherlands based around Ostend. So you had a Prussian East India Company, French, Dutch, um, Swedish, Danish. So and, and everybody had East India companies. Um, the Swedish one was one of the last to be set up. And they, they'd been too busy fighting wars around the Baltic to pay much attention to um, overseas colonies. So they were a bit late to the game, but they ended up with setting up an East India company around about 1720 and slowly began to develop trade with China. And in the end, they didn't quite corner the market, but they, they managed to control or acquire the very best quality tea. This is Canton. Canton um, in China, now Guangzhou, was the centre of the tea, tea export business from China. Another contemporary resonance is that China was a very heavily managed country um, with a very sort of rigorous uh, political system, all run from Peking, as it was called, Beijing. And um, so Canton was set up where Western countries could come and establish what's called factories, which are um, basically warehouses where tea would come, be built up, the Western ships would come in and load up and come home. And you'll see from left to right, there's um, uh, Denmark, America, because it's rather a later picture. Uh, can't tell the second flag from the left, USA, Sweden, and then the right hand end, there's um, the Netherlands. And so they all had their companies in Canton where they would trade and buy tea. So the other trick the Swedes had was that they didn't, because they had no colonies, they weren't able to trade for tea. So they paid money. What they used to do was they would come from, people would subscribe to a voyage from Sweden then the subscription would be used to, to stop off in Cadiz in Spain to buy South American silver, Spanish South American silver, which would then sell, the ship would then sell straight to Canton and they'd pay ready money for tea and bring it home straight back, no stopping anywhere. They had the biggest, fastest ships around and they went straight there, apart from going to Cadiz, Cadiz and straight back. So they were quick, they were big, and they also, because they paid cash, they got the best tea. And you'll see later on that when Swedish tea was advertised, it was specifically advertised as being the best available. The worst available, by the way, was Dutch tea, because the other barrel, as opposed to the Swedes who got very good tea and what also they also brought home was blue and white pottery and apparently Sweden has large amounts of Chinese ceramics uh, all through the country because that came back as part of the cargo in the voyage home. This is um, to try and demonstrate the, the bulk of um, imports of tea into uh, into Europe and you'll see that column one is the East India Company, column two are the Swedish and Danish companies combined. Now the figure 90% is, is a, a rough amount of the tea that the Danes and the Swedes re-exported and um, Columns one and three, getting more and more complicated, is the amount of tea imported into Europe or, uh, that wasn't held in Sweden, Denmark. And then the last column represents um, the amount of tea smuggled into Britain 
by or the, the whole mac smuggled into Britain. And so you can see that more or less half the tea smuggled into Britain, which is column four minus column one, is is imported from Sweden, Denmark. And the point of that is that you couldn't legally import tea from Sweden, Denmark, because the East India Company had the monopoly. So tea is a forbidden good. So more or less half the tea imported into Britain was smuggled. This is a, a Swedish East Indian, a modern replica, which visited Guangzhou a few years ago. Very fine, very heavy, tough ships. The Swedes are very proud of their East India Company, um, even though it existed almost wholly, almost wholly to smuggle tea. That's the headquarters of the Swedish East India Company in Göteborg, Gothenburg, um, which was its headquarters, the west facing um, port of Sweden. Um, very important centre for the warehousing and distribution of tea, Swedish tea. What they did, they would bring ships home, they would then have an auction. So this is the ship Engadine, and this is the catalogue, the sales catalogue from 1758. And as you'll see, this, these, the ones that Warwick University have got there to copy, have noted on them who bought the tea and how much they bought, what they paid for it. And this is various categories of tea. This is Bohe's, Bohea tea, which is among the cheapest and the least good. Now in the list of names, the left-hand page, the bottom two names, G. Carnegie, later on I'll be able to show that George Carnegie, who it is, uh, visited Eyemouth in the 1760s. On the right-hand page, about six or seven names down, there's a list of Scott & Company. Uh, that's a firm that um, John Nisbet of Gunsreen House traded with. And then I mentioned R and J Hall, who are a firm from Hull, uh, who also were based and have a very fine stately home on the outskirts of Gothenburg. And these people, they, the Swedes, allowed anybody to buy tea at their auctions. Denmark only allowed Danes to buy tea. Swedes let anybody do it. So they you buy tea, bring it back. Easy peasy. Um, to this country and sell it. This is the signatures of the early members of the Royal Bachelors Club. When I first found this document online, I used to say that um, this is from the this is from the website of the Royal Bachelors Club. Well, it sort of is, but it's not actually, you know, it's from the country. I said from the current website of the Royal Bachelors Club, as opposed to the 18th century website, which of course it isn't. The name in the middle, in the almost like the darkest writing, Henry Gregg. Henry Gregg, and below him is John Sibbald. And they were two of the senior people that John Nisbet of Gunsreen House did business with for a considerable period of time. In fact, Henry Gregg was the last person he traded with in the 1780s. Um, and there's, there's just this wonderful evidence of them trading together. Henry Gregg then became a leading citizen of Gothenburg and helped fund the provision of the first piped water. Another reason Scots did well in Gothenburg was that to settle in Gothenburg, particularly in the early, in the 17th century, you needed to become a Swedish citizen and English merchants at that time weren't allowed to do that. So they, they um, you've got here people like Henry Gregg, John Sibbald, and below John Sibbald is John Scott. John Scott was a leading Jacobite figure in um, Montrose during the Jacobite uprising. Uh, so, I mean, that's a wonderful list of names of Scottish and um, other merchants. It was set up, by the way, like expats in the Middle East have clubs for 
or discreet places where they could drink. This is a discreet place where expats could play billiards, which are otherwise banned. And then this is a, the map that I showed you earlier, this time with an indication of shipping movements from IMO. Um, the, um, these records come from the customs records, uh, which are very detailed. They don't show IMAV, I should say. They show Dunbar, which is the customs headquarters. But after working on the records for a few years, it became very quickly apparent as to which ships came from IMAV and which ships didn't. And it was very easy to work that out. Ship names, ships, captains, the merchants dealing with them. It was very clear what came to mind. So you've got 36 recorded voyages from Gothenburg, 18 from Hamburg and Altona. Altona, uh, which is now a suburb of Hamburg, was at that time the southernmost port of Denmark and was actually a, 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 a good point to export Danish stuff from. And then 117 from, to and from South Norway. Now, South Norway was by the time this map was printed part of Sweden at this time was part of Denmark and skippers from South Norway provided a lot of the crews and officers for the Danish East India Company ships so there's a very close connection between South Norway and um, uh, the main Danish port so and there's probably a lot of other smuggling Mary Wollstonecraft of the um, scandalous statue in London actually visited um, uh, South Resor in um, South Norway uh, in the end of late uh, 18th century and described the people there as doing nothing but um, their only trade is smuggling. So that's a rather nice. And then ships also coming in from Bergen uh, and North Norway as well, all into IMAC um, in about those, that 50 year period. Only a little bit of fishing at this time. It was a trading port. It was greatly helped by grain exports, I think, because when you've got grain exports, grain exports from IMAV, that means you've got ships in the town that can import export you've got carts and wagons coming in and out of the countryside and you've got people with disposable income to buy stuff so it, it, it just sets it up as an important port and hinterland and they used eye mouth and this is recorded in about um, 1810 in one of the agricultural histories looking back at the past, how farmers from North Northumberland used to bring their grain to Eyemouth to export because it was so much cheaper than using Berwick, which is subject to English style um, burgage taxes and so on. So, and there's, there's, when they were looking to improve the harbour in, in 1760, um, I don't think I've got this one but there's this wonderful document they produced to justify improving the harbour and um they they put was with what would almost be like a powerpoint presentation manuscript of course showing the difference in the cost of exporting grain from eyemouth compared to berwick and it was like about 10 times as expensive allegedly to export from berwick as from eyemouth This is George Carnegie in IMO. Saw him on the, the sale catalogue of the Swedish East India Company. And here he is visiting the IMO Masonic Lodge, 12th February 1761. The lodge being summoned upon an emergency, the right worshipful took the chair and the brethren being met according to messages for this purpose, the lodge was considered valid. 
We was this night visited by Brother George Carnegie from the Lodge of St. John at Gothenburg, whose health was drunk and suitable returns made. George Carnegie, so was a, a, another wealthy merchant. There is a can no relation to the steel magnate from Dunfermline, but actually there is currently a merchant bank based in Sweden called Carnegie's, which ultimately descends from his business. But he was another one of these big merchants in Gothenburg, who shared a lawyer with one of the big IMAC merchants, Robert Robertson. Um, so, which is, which I know because we found some bits of paper behind a door in Gunn's Green House, one of which was a draft letter from Robert Robertson's lawyer to Robert Robertson from 1780 odd. Amazing what you find behind the door. It was to keep the plaster out from when they replastered the wall in presumably around 1800. Uh, and the press, I found a newspaper sitting in the Edinburgh room in uh, at the Central Library, um, which is obviously part of the collection of newspapers held in uh, Robert Robertson's lawyer's office, because Robert Robertson's lawyer's name is written across the advert for the sale of uh, John Nisbet's uh, bankrupt stock um, in 1785. So that was rather nice. Guns Green House. Um, it's a bit smart in that, but it's um, designed by Rob uh, by John Adam. John Adam. Uh, Built by John Nisbet. John Nisbet's father was a small time merchant in IMAF. John had been to Dunbar, probably worked for Provost Far of Dunbar, made, you know, made lots of useful connections, uh, appears in the customs records actually on behalf of several other Dunbar merchants. Came back to IMAF the same year that the first major harbour improvements were made um, in the early 50s, 1750s built this house. Um, interestingly, window tax, he only ever paid for, I think, 17 windows. And when I counted them, there's something like 35, which you can't see the basement of that one. Um, and in fact, when he, when he was in financial difficulties, netted out that person and paid for 35. He only ever paid for 17. So given that the window tax inspector came round with a a big volume to record the numbers. I presume John Nisbet may have had a word to um, keep him uh, keep him sweet. In Gun's Greenhouse, being a proper smuggler's house, it's full of hiding places. And there's a, a hiding place in the attic um, made out of tea chests from Canton. And it's got these very tantalising Chinese characters on it. Um, and I've been in touch with an American scholar in Canton who said that they always have quality of the tea, the name of the merchant and the number. Oh, I can't read those, sorry. That's a bit of a shame. But so that, that, that's really interesting. They recycled the tea chest to make storage spaces. This is the tea chute. Um, which if you've been lucky, you might have seen it when you visited Gun's Ring House, which is a hiding place which holds about 500 pounds weight of tea. You load it at the top where it comes down from the attic and uh, uh, there was a, a, an access point two floors below. And it's, it's, it's made of Chinese tea chests which are lined with very thin lead sheet. So that's that's a good hiding place, which also perhaps lends credence to the fact that tea was perhaps distributed directly from the house as well, because if he was going just wholesaling at all, it would have gone out in tea chests. Now, this is where the law gets interesting, because as I said to you before, um, it was unlawful to import tea from Sweden into Britain. Just not allowed to do it. You couldn't pay duty, you couldn't do anything. 
there was no way you were allowed to import tea. And the, the only thing you could do would be to buy it from customs sales, seized tea, tea that was seized from smugglers. There's no reference to that here. Large quantity of fine Gothenburg teas lately purchased and last week brought into this city consisting of some thousand pounds weight. And here you are, Gothenburg teas, call it the brands of tea and the price. Congo at six and sixpence. Congo became the most popular tea in Scotland. England, it was Bohees because, because of smuggling. Congo tea was able to be bought quite cheaply. And NB, just so there's no doubt, the above teas are all neat in their packages as imported from the Swedish East India House at Gothenburg. The building we saw earlier on that come out of that. Caledonia Mercury again. Some thousand pounds weight. Now this was brought from the custom house. So this is legit. This is actually legit tea from Sweden, which is quite unusual. <coughs> this probably isn't. This is from Newcastle, grows from tea dealer, telling people he'd moved and telling them what he could sell. Likewise, a curious assortment of Gothenburg teas, which in flavor, flavor are greatly preferable to any other. <coughs> Newcastle Coral, this comes from the Edinburgh Tea Company. So this is tea that's coming from Edinburgh to a shop in Newcastle. They claim to they have been lately received from Scotland, several parcels of very fine Gothenburg teas. Very fine. <coughs> Warranted free from mixture and at least equal in quality, if not superior to any they have yet sold. This is tea. This is an advert from Leeds. This is even better because this is quite makes it quite clear. Large assortment of fine Gothenburg teas, which are well known to be much superior to the teas imported by the English East India Company and to be sold on the following low terms, being greatly below the London prices. <coughs> so this tea is much better than the legal tea and a lot cheaper. And they say it in a newspaper advert. I mean, I think that's that's the sort of <coughs> cheekiest part of the whole thing. And a controversial picture to end with, in terms of pictures, the Melville Monument. The reason this is here is because Henry Dundas um, the way, the way tea smuggling was stopped, by the way, was they cut the duty from about 120% to 12%. So it knocked the bottom out of the tea smuggling racket. Um, there was a slight problem with that in that um, it obviously takes a couple of years to, to bring tea back from, the, from China out and back. So if you suddenly stop people smuggling it, then you run out of tea. So what they, the East India Company had to do was to buy from the European East India Companies the tea that would otherwise have been bought by the smugglers and uh, use that to fill the gap in the market during the um, couple of years when while they were waiting for more tea to come back. And what other research has shown is that the proportion of Congo, Congo tea, the tea that you prefer in Scotland, that the East India Company bought shot up because that's what the requirement was for in Scotland. But what Henry Dundas did after the tax was abolished in 1784 um, was to get one of his people to interview um, a couple of tea smugglers to ask how and why they did their business and, and you know, what, what went on. And in Edinburgh, the, the smugglers would take, come to shop, take your orders, 
deliver the tea to your shop doorstep in Edinburgh and allow you anything up to four months credit. And obviously it was cheaper. Glasgow, they wouldn't deliver it to your doorstep. They only delivered it to the outskirts of Glasgow, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but they still allowed you credit. Whereas if you were buying it from the East India Company, you had to pay up front. You had to arrange your own transport to Edinburgh. Um, and it was, it, was, it was dearer. So why wouldn't you buy smuggled tea? You know, it was, it was just one of these sort of obvious things. The, the, the mechanism really was that they were, they were merchants. They were behaving as if it was a legitimate business. They used, they, they had credit. They, the, the last lot of tea that John Nisbet bought in 1785, there's actually a record of um, the payments he made to the agent for the Swedish Tea merchant. The agent for the Swedish tea merchant, by the way, was a man called John Lyon, who was in Berwick at the time, who was um, known to the authorities as a notorious smuggler. But here he was, he was taking £40 payments from John Nisbet about every quarter. You know, there's, there's a, a bill, you know, a, a, a um, promise to pay. And then he noted every time John Nisbet made a payment, or to put it fine. And that's in that the other interesting thing about that as well is that John Nisbet was making payments because he was actually made bankrupt by the Robert Robertson I referred to earlier. Robert Robertson was a big merchant in Ireland, a respectable merchant. He was um, uh, the man the church always called on to chair special committees, and he, you know, he he, he was a big wheel um, with only a minor involvement in smuggling. Um, but he made John Nisbet bankrupt by finding somebody that John Nisbet owed money to. And he tried to make him bankrupt twice within nine days. And the fact he tried twice, first time he failed, second time he succeeded. And then eventually he bought the house and his son moved into it. So there's a real, um, he wanted Nisbet's house. He was Mr. Big, Nisbet was a crook, but Nisbet had the superior house up on the hill, looking down onto Robertson's house, which is somewhere near where the ship in is, or near Jacopazzi's in Imac, down on the harbour side. So I think he deliberately set out to bankrupt Nisbet and to um, get hold of his house. Um, and, and Nisbet's affairs weren't settled until about 16 years after he died, died in 1796. We know a lot about it because his housekeeper's little little booklets have survived with all her shopping lists and things. In them. Um, so there's a really nice little story there. Anyway, um, I was told I only speak for about 20 minutes, so I've overdone that. Um, so I'll 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 stop there because I can I can talk all night, as you could probably tell. But very happy to take to take questions, and I should warn you that if you ask me a question, I will answer it probably at some length if you're unlucky.